Welcome back to our class on construction grammar. Today we're looking at words and idioms. First a short revision and an outlook. So throughout this course we're saying that constructions are pairings of form and meaning and that all levels of description involve four meaning pairs. Consequently the knowledge of language is the summary of all these constructions the network called the constructicon. In the last couple of sessions, we looked at constructionist morphology. Today, we take a closer look at what work constructions look like, as well as how we can analyse idioms in construction grammar. Take the following example sentence. But strikers are there to get kicked, just as defenders are there to kick them. What we can see there is that there are two words, kicked and to kick, but at the same time, we've got the strong intuition that these are actually one word, the same word, but just different realizations of it. In general introductory classes, we capture this phenomenon by calling kicked and to kick two word forms, which realize an underlying lexeme. We can capture this intuition in construction grammar by assuming that a kick lexeme is a generalization across these word forms. So we get things like to kick or I kick, he kicks, they kicked, he was kicked, they were kicking, so all of the different verbal forms. And we will realise that they share similarities in form, they all start with kick, and similarities in meaning because they all have a similar meaning. If we want to capture then what they all have in common, we arrive at a kick lexeme construction. For this particular construction we can say that its phonology is filled, it's got the form kick, and on the morphosyntactic level, it's a verb. Semantically, it references the cause harm frame. And in particular, it denotes that an agent strikes or propels forcibly with a foot at a body part of a victim. Here we see what the cause harm frame is, which of course is not only conjured up by kick, but also cut and bash. And the definition says that these are words that describe situations in which an agent or a cause injures a victim the body part of the victim, which is most directly affected, may also be mentioned in place of the victim. In such cases, the victim is often indicated as a genitive modifier of the body part. So he kicked John's leg. John's is the genitive modifier and leg is then the body part. In which case, the victim frame element is indicated on the second layer of the frame element layer. Our lexeme constructions do then not only merge with morphological constructions to give us the right kind of inflections for the context, but also with argument structure constructions. Kick, for example, rather easily merges with a transitive construction. So the dancer's agent kicked him and trod on him until he got to his knees and crawled away. So the dancers are the agent and him is the victim. In some situations, and there are special constructions which we will see later in the course, you can also background certain elements. This is called null instantiation. One such valency changing construction is the passive. So in he was kicked, we still conjure up via the lexeme kick the cause harm frame. And we know that there must have been some kind of agent that did the kicking, but the passive construction backgrounds it. And now only the victim is foregrounded. But as I said, we'll have to say more about how verb constructions and argument structure constructions merge in the next couple of videos. Let's for now take a closer look at what work classes are. You will probably remember from your earliest days at school that sometimes nouns were described as either a person, place or a thing, and verbs were said to describe action, processes or events. If you've already taken an introductory class to linguistics, you know that this is a problematic definition. Take the destroying frame, in which a destroyer, a conscious entity, or cause, an event, or an entity involved in such an event, affects the patient negatively, so that the patient no longer exists. An example of this would be the bomb disposal unit, as the destroyer destroyed the bomb, the bomb being the patient, with a controlled explosion. We can, however, describe the very same scene with the bomb disposal unit's destruction of the bomb with a controlled explosion. So in four, the destroying event is denoted by a verb, and in five, by a noun. So this seems to indicate that semantic-based definitions of work classes don't work, because it's the same frame, it's the same situation, right? Well, not quite. 
The important bit is that when we think about this from a cognitive point of view, we notice that there is a difference between verbs and nouns, even if they reference the same kind of frame. The important point here is that it's not important what real-world event we talk about, but how we construe it, how we in our mind construe it, look at it. So take 6 and 7, where we've got the destroying frame realised by a verb and by a noun respectively. In Langacker's cognitive grammar, the basic distinction between nouns and verbs is that the former, the nouns, denote things in a very abstract sense. So these are holistic entities whenever you do not look at something in a procedural kind of way. In contrast to this, verbs are processes, things which unfold over time. So the important difference between they destroyed the bomb and their destruction of the bomb is that in the first case, if you say destroyed, you place this on a timeline. You have the process unfolding over time. So this destroying frame is activated as a verb, as a process over time. If another speaker says their destruction of the bomb, then what they do is they treat the whole event as a thing. They do not unfold it, they do not split it up in time, and they just treat it as a chunk. So again, this is an instance of construal, how we look at a particular situation. Our noun category turns something into a thing, where we think about it holistically and not temporarily. Whereas if it's a verb, then we treat it as a process that unfolds over time. So work classes are generalizations that we consider to be prototypes in construction grammar. They have prototypical categories. Pen, milk and love are all nouns, but pen is, let's just say, a more central thing because you can grab it, it's countable, so one pen and two pens. Whereas in contrast to this, milk is an uncountable noun, so it's a mass noun, so you can say that you have a lot of milk. Um, in a glass, and if you add more milk, it's still going to be milk and not milks, plural. And then we've got things like love, which is also not countable, but at the same time is more abstract than milk. You can't really touch it, you just feel it. It's more of an emotion. All of these are nouns, but perhaps pen and other countable things can be seen as the embodied basis for the category, and therefore as more central prototypes. At the same time, our prototypical work classes will also entail morphosyntactic features. So verbs have in common that they can take a third person singular s, as in kisses, or a past tense morpheme as in kissed, or a participle ending as in kissing. On top of that, we can also look at the distribution of words. So the same frame, the destroying frame, can appear in their slot of Rome, or they slot Rome. In the first case, there's a determinative element, there, followed by a prepositional phrase that modifies the noun in this case. In the second instance, when we treat it as a temporal unfolding event, we've got a subject and an object. Finally, and importantly, semantic properties do play a role. And there it's not important whether something is a thing in the real world, or a process, but how we construe it cognitively. If we follow this definition, then we can see um, that nouns are things, verbs are processual relationships, a process that unfolds over time, whereas adjectives and adverbs are non-processual, with the difference that adjective normally denotes dative properties, whereas adverbs are dynamic properties that tell us something about the verbal action. And finally, prepositions, which I could say a lot more about, denote the relationship of a figure and a ground. So even if you have a preposition like in, the garden, where you would think that in only has the garden as a complement, you know that it also has something else. Something else must be in that garden. So the prepositional phrase gives us the ground in the garden, and outside of the prepositional phrase is, for example, the cat that is in the garden, or the shed that's in the garden. And there the shed and the cat are the thing which, things which are foregrounded, um, so the figures and the ground is given in the prepositional phrase. There is much more to be said about the semantic basis of work classes, but for now that's, I think, enough as a first introduction. If you want to know more about this, you should definitely check out Ron Langacker's work in Cognitive Grammar. Then we go to things which are bigger than words. Take a look at the jig is up. 
That's a saying, it's an idiom, it's not flexible, and it has a very specific meaning. It means the game is up, you can't do anything about it, it's over. It's easy to give a constructional analysis of this. On the phonology level, the jig and up are fixed, and we give B in capital letters because it's a lexeme. We denote the fact that we can have various word forms of to be here. So the jig was up, or the jig will be up, or the jig is up. But all the other parts are fixed. Morphosyntactically, this whole chunk is a clause, so you don't need to add anything to it when you say it, and the meaning is that the game is up. So are idioms only frozen chunks? We'll take a look at he kicked the bucket, which has the idiom idiomatic meaning of someone died, and she spilled the beans, which has the idiomatic meaning of someone telling a secret. Whereas you can't say the bucket was kicked to mean that someone has passed away, the beans were spilled is perfectly fine, and it has got the same meaning as in nine, a secret is told. In construction grammar, we can easily capture this difference between idioms. Kick the bucket, for example, is pretty fixed. So as you can see, on the phonological level, you've got a slot for the subject, the person that passed away. Kick is again a lexeme because you can tense it. It can be kicked, will kick, has kicked, and so on. But the bucket is fixed. You can't say a bucket or the buckets, so we can specify it fully. Morphosyntactically, it's a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and we have subject-verb agreement consequently between the subject and the verb. Semantically, the whole string kick the bucket denotes die, and the subject tells us who is the unfortunate person that passed away. Because kick the bucket is a chunk, we can also not split it up. In contrast to this, for spill the beans on the other hand, on the phonological level we have a slot for the subject, we have spill as the lexeme, because again you can spill the beans, or someone will spill the beans, or the beans will have been spilt. But the beans now gets an own bracket and is labelled as three. And the reason for this is because in this idiom what we can see is the beans, three, on the meaning level, is linked to the information. So whereas in kick the bucket, kick the bucket as a whole meant die, here, spill has a special meaning, indicated by the subscript to, so it means divulge, tell, and the beans has a meaning of its own, the information. This is of course a non-conventional meaning of the beans. Um, it only means this um, information in this particular idiom, but it has got its own independent meaning. And that explains why you can use it in a passive, the beans were spilt, where it still has this idiomatic meaning. So summing up. Lexeme constructions are generalizations across word forms with a frame-based meaning pole. Whether they really exist or whether they just horizontal links in the lexicon is still an open question. Work class constructions, on the other hand, are prototype categories. They have lots of morphosyntactic properties, but from a cognitive perspective, meaning also plays a huge role. Okay, so much for today. Next week, we'll look at the combination of words and bigger constructions, in particular, argument structure constructions. Thank you very much for your attention. See you next time.